Chairman. <clears throat> it's good to see you, Ms. Clark. Thank you for the work that you're doing. <clears throat> Last week, this committee held a hearing on the Supreme Court's use of the shadow docket to practically overturn Roe v. Wade by allowing Texas Texas's unconstitutional abortion ban to take effect. But abortion isn't the only area where the Supreme Court has used the shadow docket to push its radical agenda. In the lead up to the 2020 election, the Supreme Court used the shadow docket time and again to restrict voters' access to the polls in Wisconsin, Alabama, Florida, among other states, each time claiming it was improper for courts to protect the right to vote so close to an election. Here are three Supreme Court shadow docket rulings that continue, as Justice Sotomayor put it, the court's, he quotes, trend of condoning disenfranchisement. In Republican National Committee versus Democratic National Committee, the Supreme Court, in a shadow docket by a five to four vote, overturned a district court's injunction that gave Wisconsin voters six extra days to receive and mail back absentee ballots many of which had not been received because state authorities had been overwhelmed by record requests for such ballots due to the COVID pandemic. So the Supreme Court did not allow Wisconsin vo voters those six extra days. <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was ast astounding because they were trying to use a deadline for returning those ballots or mailing the ballots that had not even been received. So that was pretty hard to explain in my view, but the Supreme Court in a five to four decision ruling did that. And Murrow v. Pers uh, People versus, uh, I'm sorry, People First of Alabama, the court stayed again by a five to four vote, a lower court order that sought to ensure that citizens with a high risk of contracting COVID-19 could safely exercise their fundamental right to vote. The district court preliminarily enjoined a pair of Alabama, Alabama laws that um, enabled persons in these uh, situations to be able to vote so safely, but the Supreme Court said, nope. So the court's controversial conservative, I'm sorry, majority stayed that relief, forcing high-risk voters to risk their health in order to vote by mail. In Racer v. DeSantis, the court refused to vacate a stay of a lower court ruling that held unconstitutional Florida's scheme of disenfranchising, disenfranchising voters too poor to pay outstanding fines and fees. This is like a poll tax. So this was the shadow ruling that uh, Justice Sotomayor said it continues the trend of condoning disenfranchisement. So. We know that uh, there are some 523 anti-voter bills that have been introduced in some 47 states this year alone. So, Ms. Clark, can you think of any time when it's more important to protect voting rights than in the lead up to an election in an environment where hundreds of voter suppression bills are being introduced and where the Supreme Court is continuing its trend to disenfranchise voters. Would you like to talk a little bit about what we're facing and the importance of the kind of legislation we're contemplating? Um, thank you, Senator. The department has observed that since 2013, something has changed. The Supreme Court issued its Shelby ruling and we've started to see states and localities interpret the ruling as essentially a green light to move forward with discriminatory voting measures. Mm -hmm. The department has brought litigation in Texas and North Carolina uh, and currently has pending litigation in Georgia, but this case-by-case -case approach has not proven adequate to uh, confront all of the voting discrimination that uh, we are up against. Uh, moreover, that case-by-case that -case approach is uh, time-intensive, uh, leads to long, protracted litigation. And during the, the course of the litigation, the discriminatory voting measure is actually allowed to take effect and infects the electoral process. Our hope is that Congress will, will move quickly and swiftly to restore uh, the Section 5 preclearance process eight years after the Shelby ruling. 
And uh, I, I am running out of time, but the other case, of course, is the Branovich case, which made it hard to even bring a Section 2 case. And so the more recent Supreme Court case after Shelby just created, uh, but basically I think that the Supreme Court decided to write its own law and set up some criteria that's not even in Section 2 uh, so that it makes it that much harder. And, and again, uh, the reason why we need to pass the kind of legislation we're contemplating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Hirono. Senator Padilla. Uh, 